Well, guys, today we're going to take a break from uh, Samuel. Um, I was reading ahead, and um, where we are in 2 Samuel started with uh, the story of a concubine. And um, I'm like, probably not an appropriate Mother's Day message, uh, although I had thought about the title, Woman Problems. And, uh, and then when I looked at the calendar and saw that it's Mother's Day, I'm like, well, you know, we're not going to do that. And so, um, so we're going to be in the book of Exodus today. Uh, we'll hit a little bit of Hebrews um, as we look at, at a few women in Scripture who were fearless. Now, obviously, they weren't fearless in the true definition of the word fearless because no one is. No one is. We all struggle with that. Uh, but we see some of what they did. Uh, and so in honor of today, we're going to look at the Scripture. We're going to see how God showed himself powerful through a, a few of these ladies in Scripture. And uh, I think as we see this, I think we get a real snapshot of what God thinks of women. So this is not a, a necessarily a Mother's Day message, if you will. Uh, it's, you know, we, we want to see what God is, is doing in his word. This is the Bible and there's so much we can all learn whether we're moms or not. And so, uh, this isn't just for the moms in the house. This is for all of us as we open God's word together. There's a lot for us to glean. Let me give you a little bit of background because we've not been in the book of Exodus, but just a, a little backdrop before we start this morning. Uh, there was a great famine in the land that God had given his people and, and, and God's people ended up in the, in the country of Egypt. They were searching for food. Remember Pharaoh, some of you seen the movie, you know, the eight hour movie. Is it eight hours? It's pretty long. Um, you know, Moses and, and all of that. Um, but Pharaoh was the leader of Egypt and, and this Pharaoh was favorable. He was kind to God's people. Remember the story of Joseph and how Joseph was liked by his father more than the other brothers and Joseph's brothers didn't like that too much, nor would I have liked it. So they sold Joseph and he ended up uh, in slavery, but he ended up in Egypt and he ended up as second in command to the, to the leader, uh, to the Pharaoh there. So amazing, you know, from, uh, from this you know, little boy, if you will, who was hated by his brothers to becoming second in command of a great superpower. Amazing how God planned that. Uh, God's people were in Egypt about 430 years. Well, about 400 years into it, after the generation of Joseph, another king came along. First Pharaoh's gone, a new Pharaoh comes onto the scene, and this Pharaoh is not friendly to God's people. Unlike the one who was there with Joseph, he is not friendly. If you need a Bible, raise your hand. I forgot to say that. Please raise your hand. We'll, we'll open the word here in a minute. Thank you guys for that. Just raise your hand. So anyway, so he was not kind. He was not friendly to God's people. He would oppress them. He would enslave them. Why? Because they were becoming a threat to his power. Okay? Uh, he forced them to work in the fields. He forced them to make bricks. They would build cities for him. He just worked God's people, the Hebrews, he worked them ruthlessly. But the more he oppressed them, the more they grew. This king, this king could not break the Hebrews. He couldn't do it. And, you know, and I think about that just in, as a way of backdrop here. May we, the kingdom of Jesus Christ today here on this earth, be a threat to the kingdom of the world. You know, and David shared this a bit when he, when he led us a couple weeks ago in the first chapter of, of Daniel. Um, guys, as we hold forth life, um, we, we want to see culture change the truth of God's word and his promises. And we get to do that. So may we go against the flow in that way. May we stand strong under the tricks of the enemy, the tricks of the world to enslave us. And may we trust uh, Christ to come through whatever our situation is, to come through standing. Again, God's people could have caved, but they didn't. They had a tenacity. God had called them, and, and not even this evil king could, could stop them from growing. In Exodus chapter 1, Pharaoh said to the people, he said, the people, and he said this to his people, he said, the, the people of the children of Israel are more and mightier than we. Come, let us deal shrewdly with them, lest they multiply. So what is he saying? He's saying, look it, they've become a problem. We've got to stop them from growing anymore. Otherwise, they're going to gang up and they're going to fight against us. That's what we get to do as Christians. We don't necessarily go on the total offensive. But as guys, as the kingdom of God grows, as we grow, as we're discipling one another and the kingdom grows, we are going on the offensive when it comes to the kingdom of this world. So the, the king of Egypt was saying, those 
Those God people, there's, there's too many of them and they're too mighty. That's exactly right because not even enslavement could stop God from blessing his people. It doesn't matter. God is a God who blesses. So we're going to look this morning at some of the texts in Exodus, a little bit in chapter 1, a little bit in chapter 2. We're not going to spend a ton of time in this, uh, but we're going to look at some pretty fearless women. And, and again, this is not just something for the women to glean from today. I think this is something that each of us can glean from. But let's begin in the book of Exodus chapter 1. Uh, and again, we're not going to do the whole chapter, but I wanna, I'm going to walk us through some uh, of this, having given you the backdrop here, the background of where we are. Let's start reading with verse 15. Uh, we'll read down to verse 22 together. Then the king of Egypt spoke to the Hebrew midwives, of whom the name of one was Shifra and the name of the other was Pua. And he said, when you do the duties of a midwife for the Hebrew women and see them on the birth stools, if it is a son, then you shall kill him. But if it is a daughter, then she shall live. But the midwives feared God and did not do as the king of Egypt commanded them, but saved the male children alive. So the king of Egypt called for the midwives and said to them, why have you done this thing and saved the male children? And the midwife said to the Pharaoh, well, because the Hebrew women are not like the Egyptian women, for they are lively and give birth before the midwives come to them. Therefore, God dealt well with the midwives, and the people multiplied and grew very mighty. And so it was because the midwives feared God that he provided households for them. So Pharaoh commanded all his people at this point, saying, Every son who is born you shall cast into the river, and every daughter you shall save alive. We'll stop there. Got a group of heroes here, or heroines, I guess you would say, and these midwives. So the population was growing quickly. There were no doctors at the time, so the midwives would help the women deliver their babies. I remember distinctly one of ours. Uh, uh, Mandy, you'll remember this. We barely made it. Mandy was driving Melanie and I to the hospital, and we got there, and, and anyway, so anyway, it was quick. Um, <laughs> But we made it. Um, but uh, midwives are good. They're good to have. But there were two midwives here, two, two ladies. One is named Shifra, and the other is Pua. And these are Jewish names. One means beauty, and one means splendor. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily name my child that today. However, they're beautiful. The, the meanings of these names are, are, are beautiful. I think they're beautiful in that they stood for and they promoted life. And may we emulate these two women by standing in the gap for life. That's what it's about. I think about the baby bottle campaign that we're doing this month. Because it's not about coins and bottles. It's about saving lives. It's about bringing the truth to, to people who are in need. So thank God for, for, the, for, for these two women here. Now, maybe they were lead midwives, I guess you would, you would, you would say. And, and they had other midwives that served under them. So Pharaoh summoned, Pharaoh called for them, and he commanded, you know, the veins are popping out in his neck. He's angry because he, th these, these God people are threatening his power. <laughs> That's what we're supposed to do, y'all. We're supposed to threaten the power in the, of, of the people and the systems of the world, you know. So he's like, if it's a boy, kill him. Now, why in the world would he do that? Obviously, the real issue here, biblically, goes back to Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, when, when God is speaking, if you will, to Satan uh, at, at the very beginning. He says, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. See, God told Satan about the one who was coming one day, who would be born, none other than Jesus, who would crush his head. And that's what Jesus came to do. So from the very beginning of time, we see that Satan wanted to stop that. So all the way back in Exodus, what does this have to do with Jesus? Where is Jesus in the scripture today? Yeah, God, excuse me, Satan rather, wanted to use the power of, of the Pharaoh of Egypt to stop these male children from being born. And Satan in the high, you know, back of the bleachers is like, yeah, because if we can do that, then we can stop this one who's going to crush my head from being born. Well, guess what, Satan? Nothing's going to stop Jesus from coming, right? So all this goes back to that. But, it, but I think Pharaoh made a huge miscalculation. And we see this as we read these verses. Verse 17 says, The midwives feared God. See, the Egyptian king made a miscalculation here. Now, the word fear here, um, in, the, in this context, the word fear means reverence or honor, okay? Now, yeah, 
they may have been shaking in their sandals because of Pharaoh. I would have been too, right? I'm not going to just look at this big king and go, ah, you're no problem for me, mister. No, I'd have probably been a little bit nervous, and I'm sure they were. But they honored God over and above the rule of the king. Why? They had set their hearts on God, and they were willing to take a risk. They were willing to disobey the king. He could have taken them out for that. but They were willing to do that to honor God. God put something in their heart. God was using these midwives. Point number one, if you're following along, we have a few points today. But number one, this is something for each and every one of us here. Honor and obey God over and above and before any man. Honor and obey God over and above and before any man or any rule or any person or any system or any society or any culture or any ism. God is first. As long as we can wholeheartedly follow the Lord, then whatever else we do is cool beans, man. But we got to know that we're honoring God. We see the scripture in the scripture all throughout the, the word. Again, Daniel, as we just learned a couple weeks ago, you know, not eating the king's food. And the three, the three Hebrew boys, you know, remember you'll read a little bit later, Daniel there and in, in, uh, how, you know, how King Nebuchadnezzar built the statue. I don't want to steal too much from David because he'll be getting here as we go back and forth between a couple books of the Bible. But they're in that fire, man. And and here's what they said in Daniel. They said, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from this burning furnace and he'll deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods. They're like, look, if you want to chuck us in the fire, chuck us in the fire, but we're not going to bow to your God. We see that. We see that in them. And I just love that. I pray that we can do that, guys. I pray that we can have the tenacity in our spirit to not cave when people around us do. It is so easy to compromise. It can be. It can be so easy to blend in and compromise. And God calls us out. And that's what he did here with these these Hebrew midwives. They weren't going to bend. They weren't going to be obedient uh, to the king. Remember then in the New Testament, remember the apostles? Remember how the high priest was like, well, you can't teach in the name of Jesus. And I'll paraphrase. The apostles were like, dude, who cares what you think? We got to speak what Jesus has done. Guys, are we in that position? Do we just got to speak what Jesus has done in our lives? Or are we comfortable just sitting back and remaining quiet because the powers that be are telling us we should be quiet? Don't be quiet. Don't be quiet. Talk, speak. Don't be obnoxious. <laughs> you know, don't be obnoxious. But let's not let the world quiet our witness. The way we live and the words we speak need to be to honor and obey the Lord Jesus? Are we willing to take risks? Are we willing to live dangerously in order to honor God? You know, back when we studied through 1 Samuel chapter 2, verse 30, God says, those who honor me, I will honor. We've got to remember that. We want him on our side in that way. So now we see these midwives, but we also see the moms. Hello, this is Mother's Day, right? But no, the Israelite mothers themselves, they continued to have children knowing the risk. They knew their kids could be killed. And Pharaoh hated that they kept having children. The moms were seeing these babies as blessings and he saw them as a threat. He wanted to be the king. He wanted to have the power. He wanted to rule. But these women, and this is a lesson for us, they didn't let the fear of what might happen stop them from honoring God and leaving a heritage. And that indeed is a lesson for each of us. So point number two, if you're following along, don't let yourself get paralyzed by the fear of what might happen. Don't let yourself get paralyzed by the fear of what might happen. Because check this out, it might not happen. I know for me, going through this health journey the past few months has been like a crazy roller coaster, you know, that I didn't want to ride on. And, and, you know, one of my last scans, Melanie was driving into Fredericksburg, and, and I know I've shared this ad nauseum probably with my Thrive Group and some other folks, and maybe I've shared it with all of you guys, but if I've already shared this, then I'll blame it on the anesthesia. It's just still wearing off a month later, right? I'll just use that line as long. I think I've overused that, but anyway, it's all good. But as we were driving into to Fredericksburg, and, and, you know, I'm, I'm like, okay, God, okay, all right, all right, so this is happening, and this could be happening, and, and what about this, and how's this going to work out, and, and God, what in the world is going to happen if this happens? And I'm asking all these questions. I know none of you do that. And, and I'm driving, or she's driving, and I look up at the moon, and God says, hey, knucklehead, check this moon out that I created. So I look up at the moon, and it was the time of day and the time of the month when it, you could only see half the moon. Do you guys, are you following me? 
So I'm looking at the moon and, and have, if you've ever looked at half a moon or a quarter of a moon or a crescent or however you want to call it during the day, can you see the dark part of the moon? Can, what if you strain? Can you see it if you really strain? No, it's just like, it's just like there's only half a moon there. And, and, and God spoke to my, and no matter how hard you try, you can't see it. It's hidden. It's, it's as, just as if it's not there. And here's where I, my problem was. I was trying to fill that in. I can't see that. God, I'm questioning you about what I can't see. And God says, son, I love you. Look at what you can see, not what you cannot see. Because it's just as if it's not there. And I'm not going to move the moon and show it to you right now. Just hang in there. That's that's what the Lord spoke to me. And my psalm, my banner song in this whole time, Psalm 46, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling, we will not fear. Okay, here it is, man, that's scripture. So there it is. I'm not going to fear, right? (laughs) It should be easy. And it's not. Um, But these women didn't let the fear of what might happen stop them from doing what they needed to do. I had a conversation with a guy a couple days ago. And here's what he told me. He goes, man, the world is messed up. And I'm like, amen. No news flash there, right? And and he was looking around and he said, you know, I feel so bad for these children. And and, and I'm like, yeah, I understand what you're saying, man. Like I had every one of my kids, I remember... And we've all done this. We hold our babies and we're like, I wonder, I wonder what they're going to experience. What's going to be the news headline in 25 years? What are they going to live through when they get in high school? What's, what are they facing? And you can get like doom and gloom, man. You know, I mean, you can really get down on this thing if, 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 we're, not, if we're not careful. But guys, look at our children are opportunities to be vessels of hope in this world. Sure, none of us wants life to be hard for our kids. I get that. Here's what Psalm 127 says. Children are a heritage from the Lord, a reward from Him. Check it out. The psalm says they're a reward. So can we take Psalm 127.3 out of our Bibles? Because they're no longer a reward in this messy world that we live in? Absolutely not. I think if any time ever in history they're a reward, they're a reward right now. Especially kids who are being raised, a generation that's being raised to rise up and lead, to love Jesus Christ, even as Mandy was sharing in that video and other moms, to love Jesus, to have faith, to have love, to stand for the truth. It's, you know, the writer goes on to say that they're a reward. They're like arrows in a warrior's hands. And when we raise our children, whether they're our kids or they're not, because we can invest in any child. You don't need to be a mom or dad to invest in a kid. We've got neighborhoods in King George that need people investing in their kids because they're struggling. And a lot of them are too ashamed to come and ask for help. But we know they need help because that's the world we live in. But when we pour into their lives, it's like we're the warriors and they're the arrows. And we get to launch them into a world to snuff out darkness. I think they're a reward, man. That's what we get to do. So let's not hang our heads at what our kids are going to face. Let's raise up mighty men and mighty women to seize the opportunity to change this world. That's why we're here. For crying out loud, we're not here to hold up in the back closet until Jesus comes back. You know? And and not that you guys live that way. Um, But man, let's be active and engaged uh, in this way. And let's let's not let the fear of what might happen stop us from doing what we should be doing. And you can apply that in any capacity. Let's read on. I started preaching, and I'm going to run out of time, but that's okay. Um, Exodus chapter 2, next chapter, verse 1. And a man of the house of Levi went and took his wife, a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son, and when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him three months. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, dabbed it with asphalt and pitch, and put the child in it, and laid it in the reeds by the river's bank. And his sister stood afar off to know what would happen or what would be done to him. Then the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the baby wept. 
So she had compassion on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, hmm, shall I go and call a nurse for you from the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for you? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, go. So the maiden went and called the child's mother. Then Pharaoh's daughter said to her, take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him, and the child grew, and she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. So she called his name Moses, saying, because I drew him out of the water. So we have, we have a, a father and a mother. We have Moses' mom here. Neither one of them is mentioned by name here, by the way. You'll see. None of the people here are mentioned by name. They will be mentioned later by name in Exodus. But Moses' father was Amram, and his mother was Jochebed. And it says that in verse 2, she saw that he was a beautiful child. Don't we all think that when our baby's born? Um, you look at your baby and you're like, oh, he's the most beautiful baby I've ever seen. And somebody else looks at him and goes, yeah. <laughs> There's something in that paraphrase, right? It's like, what do you mean by that? You know, but they're all beautiful, you know. But anyway, so Moses' mom looks at the baby and says, oh, he's the cutest thing. The NIV, I like the NIV, says he was no ordinary child. Guys, I think there's a little something here like this, and we can talk about this in our Thrive Groups this week. This is not merely about looks. Oh, he's so cute. Gucci, Gucci. No, it's not that. It's not just about his looks. Perhaps God was impressing on mom's heart that this boy was special. And I think in a way he impresses that on our hearts about all of our kids. But in the presence of this maniacal king who was threatening death, we know that God was raising up a deliverer. Man, I, I want to pray that. I want to believe that for my kids. I'm not saying they're going to be Moses, and I'm not saying we're going to chuck them in a basket in the Potomac. But, okay, not that we don't occasionally think about it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Just have to get a real big basket. <laughs> curl up, boy, curl up. No, I'm just kidding. Oh, my goodness. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> Man, that's, that's called a bad rabbit trail and you lose your focus. Um, but I want all my kids to be deliverers. Jesus is the capital D deliverer. I hope that Judah and Josiah and Jaden and Joel and JT are little D deliverers. And they take the light and truth of Jesus into this world and make a real big difference. So mom hid him. Mom recognized the gift that God had given her. And, you know, sometimes we have to protect our children from the mess of the world. Don't be ashamed to protect your kids from the mess of the world. Point number where are we? three. Point number three. This is application for us. Pray for eyes to spot a gift of God and a heart to safeguard that gift. Pray for eyes that are able to spot a gift of God, recognize it, and a heart that's committed to safeguarding that gift. I'm not advocating parents hover and smother their kids, you know. That's not necessarily a good thing. But setting boundaries and holding them accountable and helping them to be guarded against the enemy's arrows. Listen, that's how you raise leaders and God-fearers and, and, and world changers. But it tells us that when she could no longer hide him. That's a bittersweet little couple of words there. When she could no longer hide him. We've done it as long as we can. We can't do it anymore. She recognized that. And that time will come. And when that time came, her, the mom, Jacobet, she made this basket. She didn't go to like, you know, Target or Walmart and buy this basket. She weaved this basket. She took special care. She dabbed it in pitch and tar. She waterproofed it. She sealed it. She wanted to make sure this thing was going to hold her baby boy. And she set him off. One day, sooner than she would hope, and it, it had come, she was going to have to let him go. So she sent him off in this little boat basket. And the moment that basket left her fingertips, I can only imagine she hoped, she trusted she would see her child again, but she didn't know that. It wasn't a lack of faith that she put Moses in the water. It was because of her faith in God 
that she did that. And she was annaled in Hebrews chapter 11. We'll read that in a little bit, just a couple of verses in the great hall of faith. She goes down because of what she did. It wasn't in fear. It was in faith in God that what she did. Let's make a fourth point. Trust God even in moments that seem all wrong. They seem all wrong. And, and, and Jochebed was human, and she was a woman who loved her baby. She was a family woman, and as she did this, she had to, in part, at a moment, shake her head and go, this is just so messed up. I shouldn't have to be doing this. This is wrong. Maybe there was a part of it because I'm not going to do this. No. But then the Lord said, no, do this. No, do this. Guys, we can be battling even within our own minds. Sometimes things seem unfair. They seem wrong. God, this shouldn't be happening to me. I'm your kid. Don't you take special care of me? Don't, aren't you going to save me from this? This isn't the kind of thing we should have to deal with. This just seems so wrong. Those are the moments we have to trust God, just like Jochebed did. Quite literally at this point in her life, her son and his future was out of her hands. She had to let go. But it wasn't out of God's hands. Guys, maybe you don't have kids. Maybe you're in a position right now where you do have kids. Let's talk to you for a second. If you have children, maybe you're at the point, and I'm not, I'm not saying they're ready to fly the coop and you're ready to be an empty nester necessarily. Maybe you are, maybe you're not. But there might be something in their life where God is saying, you just need to let go. And you'll know who you are if that's you. Or maybe you don't have kids and this is about something else in your life. You're holding on to something and you're trying to manage it or you're trying to do it. You're trying to make it happen. God is like, you've got to let that go. You've got to stop trying to command this thing. You've just got to loosen your grip, let it go, and trust me. Maybe we might be there. We, we could all probably say we're there with one, in one way or another. Let's look here at another lady. Her name is Miriam. Again, we don't know her name by this chapter and verse, but her name is in the scriptures elsewhere. And, and, and so this is Moses' older sister. She's a part of this whole thing. She stayed involved. She stood at a distance and watched because she wanted to see what was going to happen. Now, mom could have said, hey, Miriam, go. And, and maybe that's the way that worked out. But she did. She stood, um, she stood at a distance and, she's, and she's, she's watching. She's not going to walk away. And that's a good thing. And I think we can learn a lesson from Miriam, point number five. This is for all of us, man. It's for all of us. Stay close and get involved for the sake of someone else. Stay close and get involved. Be involved for the sake of someone else. You know, God charted the journey that that baby would take on these waters in the Nile. God caused this basket to become visible from among those reeds. God did that, but Miriam had faith. I think she had faith in God. Her walk to the river was a walk of faith. She was believing against all odds. Guys, you know, she might go, oh, it's too late. What's the point? The boat's gone, the basket's gone, my baby brother's gone. But she didn't, right? Don't ever believe, guys, that it's too late, that anybody or anything is too far gone or too out of control for God. That's called faith. If we can figure it all out, we don't need the faith, right? The faith is that's what we live by because, because we can't. We, we have faith to know that God's going to take care of the dark side of that moon that we can't see. Miriam potentially had the faith to know that God was going to do something with her brother. Now there's another woman, Pharaoh's daughter. We don't know her name. It could have been Lulu. <laughs> you know, there's no names here. But her daughter, this is the, the Pharaoh's daughter. Wait, hold up. God is going to use this evil king's daughter. God is like that. He holds all things together. God can use anybody, anything, anytime. Doesn't matter if they're an enemy of him. He'll still use them because he's in control. It's amazing what we see here. And I'm wondering if she set her alarm when she went to take her bath that day down in the Nile. Because the details here are crazy. You couldn't plan this. It says in verse 6, she saw the child and she heard the baby weeping. She goes to the basket and God's like, not yet, not yet. She opens the basket. There's the baby. God's like, now. And the baby goes, wah, <laughs> right? Right on cue. God had this whole thing figured out. Melted her heart. She's looking at this baby going, you're the one. You're one of the ones dad wants to kill over my dead body. Isn't that neat? 
So she calls her maidservant and says, go get the baby. And his maidservant, there's another lady. We don't know her name, and culturally she was unimportant, but she was very much not unimportant. This unnamed slave girl of the Egyptian king's daughter, if it weren't for her, we wouldn't have the Old Testament. Think about that if you think you're nobody. This is an unnamed slave girl who got a basket out of the water. She pulled the deliverer out of the Nile. Wonder if she knew what she was doing. But she snatched Moses out of the water and saved a life. And then the sister, she's like, well, whoa, oh, 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 maybe I should get someone to nurse the child for you. Right? And, and, and Pharaoh's daughter's like, that's a great idea. So sister goes, and who does she, does she, does she dial a nurse? Is it 1-800-FIND-ME-A-NURSE? No, she knew exactly who to go. God had worked this whole thing out. She goes to the baby's mother and says, Mom, God's done it. You're needed. You're needed. And so we see that Jochebed gets her baby back for a while. For a while. Such a neat story. Number six. And let me backdrop number six with this. Despite her father's powerful, brutal command to kill, Pharaoh's daughter had compassion. And I think our point number six is this. Go against the flow of society and sometimes even those that are closest to you. We got to be willing to go against that, that flow. We got to be willing to resist. We got to be willing to say, no, no, I'm not going to do that. But dad wants me to kill this. No, I'm not going to do that. Quite the opposite. My heart is moved. I'm going to do something quite contrary to what dad wants me to do. I'm going to keep this baby alive. And again, guys, her compassion was not just a feeling. She acted. She did something about it. And I just want to draw this point to our hearts. Doing what is right usually requires action. One of my pet peeves is people that talk about how bad the world is, but they're not doing anything to make it better. It's just like election time. It's like, did you vote? No, I didn't vote. Well, then be quiet. You can't complain. You know, it's like we, the world's messed up, but are we, are we engaging? Are we doing something about it? For crying out loud, we have the Holy Spirit living in us. For crying out loud, we got the word of God, the truth, the promises of his word. We've got power. You know, and we let the world steamroll over us and we bemoan and talk and blog and sit over coffee and talk about how messed up the world is. What are we doing about it? We're the living body of Christ. We've got power this world has never seen. So let's be active. You know, being right means doing what is right and doing what is right means we have to be involved. We've got to be doing something. Did you catch the part that Pharaoh's daughter said, and, and, and we will pay you your wages? Did you see that? She got paid for being a mom. They should try that today, shouldn't they? Wow. All the ladies said amen. I heard that. Husbands, give your wives a raise. Come on. You know? No, that's cool. Like, the enemy's going to fund it. <laughs> I just think that's neat. Satan is a jerk. He doesn't even get that he's losing here, but, and he really, he really is losing. The faith of a mom, the faithful sister standing by, the heart of Pharaoh's daughter. God was doing something here. I love this. C.H. McIntosh was an old Plymouth Brethren dude back in the 1800s, and he's got some cool stuff if you read him. He said this, Remarkable providence, admirable wisdom. Truly, Jehovah is wonderful in counsel and excellent in working. May we learn to trust him with more artless simplicity and thus our path shall be more brilliant and our testimony more effective. Just trust him. And we see the faith of these ladies here doing just that. So Moses was taken by mom again and she nursed him as much as the Bible tells us three years. God again divinely set up Moses with his own mom. But here's the clincher. She had to let him go again. You know, and I think she knew that. And she had to let him go to this king's daughter who the word tells us became his mother. It's hard to read that. After everything that's happened here, now Jochebed's got to walk away from that season and 
allow her child to be mothered by someone else. Last point. No, no, we had two more. Next to the last point, number seven. There is a time when we must let go of our children and let God have His way in them. I know this let go and let God thing got overused on bumper stickers and t-shirts and the like. But it's true. It is true. And it's true here. You know, it's true in a lot of things, but it's true. How hard that must have been for her to do that. But maybe, I don't know. God prepared her. God did a work in her. We don't get to read all those details, but I'm sure he worked in her heart. But, but she trusted God. But, but just think about this. Little did she likely know that as she poured into this little boy, she was literally changing the world. She really was. And I know it, it can be hard for us to let our kids go. But again, we send them with prayer. We send them with the hope and the aim that they are going to change the world. You know, Moses, when he was 40 years old, if you keep reading, we won't do it. We don't have time. But, but keep reading. We'll hit on it a little bit in Hebrews as I close this here in a minute. But, you know, he's going to renounce the throne. And he's going to choose to suffer with God's people instead of enjoying the fleeting pleasures of the sinful living of those in Egypt. Why would he do that? Or maybe we should ask, how would he be able to do that? I think part of the reason is because as, as mom had nurtured him, she taught him a faith in God. I think she did more than just feed that baby for three years. I think she prayed over him and poured into him. Let me finish at Hebrews 11. Turn there. At Hebrews 11, we'll wrap up with this. This is the Hall of Faith. That's what it's known as. It's all the people in the Bible that we want to be like, that we can be like. We really can the Holy Spirit was choosing to continue to write Hebrews 11, I would hope he would choose me. I don't know that he would. Um, but we read here. Let's look at verse 23 through 27, and we'll stop here. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 23. By faith, Moses, when he was born, was hidden three months by his parents because they saw he was a beautiful child. And they were not afraid of the king's command. By faith, Moses, when he became, now listen, when he became of age, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God than to enjoy the passing pleasures of sin, esteeming the reproach of Christ greater riches than the treasures in Egypt, for he looked to the reward. By faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king. For he endured as seeing him who is invisible. Wow. Wow. Point eight. I think about these women. I think about Moses' mom here when, I, when we make this point. Each and every time we pour into someone, it is an investment for the future. And that someone doesn't need to be your child. It can be anybody. It can be any child. It can be any adult. It can be the person four chairs to your left or right. It can be the person sitting six rows in front of you or behind you. Anytime we pour into someone, it's an investment for the future. And I will add here, as I've already said, and let me remind you, it says by faith, <clears throat> Moses was hidden. It wasn't by fear. When she put him in that water, she trusted in God, and God did a mighty, mighty work. Guys, I pray we're living by faith, and I pray we can learn a thing or two from these ladies that we've looked at today in this Old Testament book of Hebrews and a little bit, in, or Exodus rather, and, um, and, and I pray that we can just apply these things to our lives. Ask your heart some questions. Where is God taking you and leading you? Can we have uh, the worship folks come up? We're going to close and respond in some songs uh, this this morning, um, but every every one of the women in in our in the in the scripture this morning that we looked at, they they resisted in their own way. They resisted the kingdom of darkness, and and everybody had had a role to play. And and you know, my question for us is: Are we again? Are we joining this world, or are we are we resisting uh, what is around us? I pray we're resisting. Are, are we caving into man's demands and desires? Or are we fearlessly honoring God above and beyond all things? I pray that we're doing the latter. 
Are we allowing ourselves to be paralyzed by fear of what might happen or again might not happen? Or are we moving forward in faith and trusting God to gain new ground? I pray that's not just a Christianese thing. I pray that that's a real thing. I want to trust God and I want to move forward as long as forward is forward. That's where I want to be. Are we actively pouring into the next generation? Guys, that's huge. I love the number of young people that we have in our church fellowship here. You know, it's, it, a lot of people say, you know, we got to take care of the kids because they're church of tomorrow. And I understand what they mean by that. But when I look at our kids here and I see these precious kids who did these, and some of them aren't so many, they're not so kids anymore. They're, you know, they could beat, some of these guys could beat me up, right? Because they grow up fast. These guys aren't the church of tomorrow. I think this is today. This is right now. And we're blessed and honored to have a group of young people in our church family here that we all, every one of us, every one of us, not just the Sunday school teachers, not just the small group leaders, not just the youth leaders, but we as a family get to pour into our young people from babies all the way up through graduating high school. We're a family. This is a body. Guys, we got a lot of ground to cover. So may we, like these women, be fearless. Not that we don't shake in our shoes every now and then, but may we seek to honor God above and beyond and over all things. Amen? Can we do that together? Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for what you have revealed to our hearts this morning and reminded, many of us have just been reminded of things we knew. God, I pray, Holy Spirit, that you have prompted each heart today in one specific area where you will follow up with us. And you are asking us to move forward or you're asking us to let go of something or you're asking us to see something from a different perspective. God, give us your eyes to see. Give us your heart to walk this out as you would have us, Lord. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time we've had in your word together today. Lord, just be with us now as we cry our hearts out to you as we respond to you in praise, Lord. We ask this in your name. Amen. Guys, elders.